we were at a very significant bridge this morning. In front of me stands the amazing city of Tuane. And in this city, there are two kinds of youth, two kinds of individual. The fortunate young ones who can access education and have the resources, and the unfortunate ones who, no matter how badly they want it, will never know what it is to experience education. But we're living in a knowledge economy. We're living in an age where information, the ability to process information and education is everything. I'll go as far as to say it's essential to survival. I think it's important for me to clarify here what I mean by education. The word educate actually comes from the root word educe, which means to draw out, or the ancient Latin word educare, which means the same thing. So in other words, education is not about filling the mind of someone with something, but education is rather the drawing out of it. Education is giving to a curious and inspired mind hints, tips, clues, and ways in which they can rethink or perceive the world. It brings out the potential that's already latent in someone rather than puts potential into them. That is education. So education is no longer what it was meant to be, something that induces the potential latent within you. But what is it now? It's a mere market signal. What do I mean by market signal? In economics, this term is used to bridge the information gap between the seller of a product and the buyer of a product. Let me give you an example. When you go to a shop and you want to buy a product, the seller of that product may know more about the product's quality than you as the buyer, right? So you're in a disadvantaged position. So you need to have a guarantee of the product's quality. You need what we call a market signal. A good example of this would be a five-year guarantee. If you go and buy a new TV and you get a five-year guarantee, you know that you can bring that TV back if it doesn't offer the quality that the seller promises you which is a perfect market signal. Likewise, with education. Think of it this way. Education is a labor market signal. Employers are buyers of labor and you are the seller of your labor to a particular employer. Education offers the employer a signal for them to be able to prove your quality or your worth. By looking at your CV and looking at your degree certificate, they can determine of what level, of what quality, and what you can offer them. So it's a fair market signal. But there comes a problem with that. It means that education has been reduced to a mere commodity. In other words, we as young people, or as anyone looking for education, go out there and purchase education. We buy it in order to have a market signal for employers so we can become attractive to them, right? But what happens with that? It reduces education to a mere commodity that we buy in order to access and participate in the economy. But think about it this way. If education is no longer about framing your potential, if it's no longer about developing your potential, to the maximum, if it's becoming a mere market signal for you to get a job or for you to get opportunities, in a world where education and information and knowledge is no longer scarce, where at the click of the button you can learn almost anything in the world, may that not render your education useless in future? Hmm. It's only when we treat education as a means to an end and not an end in itself that we render it useless. Think of it this way. What is education at the end of the day? 
Isn't it the way in which we come to learn about the universe and the beautiful world that we inhabit, the world around us? It's exactly that. So my challenge to every single human being out there, young or old, who's considering educating themselves still, is this. Education should not be about the outside world, but about you and defining your relationship to it. Educate yourself according to who you are, according to your talents and interests. It was Master Samael Leon Wio who said that a fundamental education is the science of consciousness. It is the science of how we discover how we relate to other human beings, to nature, and to the world around us. And it's exactly that. I want to take you right now to a very special place to meet very special people that embody the essence of that quote and what a fundamental education truly is. People all around the world know that South Africa has produced some of the greatest human beings that have shaped human history. It inspires me when I think of guys like Nelson Mandela, or Tambo, guys like Anton Limbede, who I'm going to speak about now, an inspiring individual, Professor Walter Battis, Professor Z.K. Matthews. Every single one of these individuals had to surmount huge barriers just to access education. They faced social oppression, they faced racism, they faced lack of resources and poverty. For example, consider guys like Nelson Mandela or Ahmed Kathy Kathrada, who became some of the first South Africans to be educated as Robben Island prisoners. That's inspiring. We can learn a lot from these guys. Our first great scholar for the day is going to be Anton Muziwake Lembede. Anton Lembede came from a poverty-stricken home and very, very difficult circumstances, but he managed to rise above them. At age 19, he enrolled at Adams College for his first taste of education. Anton was noted for his brilliance with languages and his great dedication. At that time, Anton didn't write much about politics, though he later became a political hero. His focus was mostly on self-reliance and self-knowledge. At age 22, Anton left Adams College and started taking up teaching duties, but his hunger for education never abated. He continued to do part-time studies and enrolled for a Bachelor of Arts degree, majoring in philosophy and Roman law. He then later enrolled for another degree, majoring in law. And after all that, at the age of 28, Lembede enrolled for his master's. He was one of the first few Africans to get a master's in philosophy. How amazing. And guess what his title was? The conception of God as it is expounded by or found in the writings of philosophers from Descartes to the present day. In there, he defined what an African ideology is and what it means to be self-reliant and psychologically free. Now, the next guy we're going to be speaking about is also a force to be reckoned with. Solomon Chekisho Blaiki, also known as Sol Blaiki. Sol was born on a farm in Boshoff in the Free State and he was part of the few missionary educated Africans to start the South African Native National Congress, which later became the ANC. Sol Blaiki traveled frequently to England in order to spread awareness about the racial injustices that he was facing back home in his country of birth. Sol is a prime example that education is about the individual, not about the external knowledge. Beyond missionary school, Saul had no education, yet he became a giant that we all remember in our country's history. 
Solomon Blakey was one of the first black people to keep a journal and a diary during war times. During the siege of Mafeking, during the Boer War, he kept a journal that has given us a different perspective on what really went down during that period. Sol was one of South Africa's first people to translate Shakespeare's work and other novels into Setswana, his home language. He was also the editor of multiple vernacular newspapers at the time, even though, as I said, he had little education for it. He made it work. Sol was fluent in English, Dutch, German, Afrikaans, Zulu, Tswana, French, and Kosa. Sol was truly, truly one of those heavyweights. He published the first novel to be published by a black person in this country. Until today, the legacy of the ANC, freedom, democracy, intellect, journalistic freedom, and sharing of knowledge to different platforms, whether formal or informal, lives on. You didn't have a degree, bud, but man, you were educated.